Good morning, church. Thank you for joining us, whether you're online or watching us in the future via time travel, because we can do that now, thanks to YouTube. So thank you, Google. I'm glad to be with everyone this morning. We are in our first week of our Advent series. We are now in that Christmassy time. Thanksgiving is over. I hope you all had a blessed Thanksgiving, whether it was virtual with family or in your own home with your loved ones. However you celebrated this week, if you're here in America, I hope that you had a blessed Thanksgiving. But that is the cutoff. Now the rest of the year is gone. It is full-blown Christmas time. So we are going to be starting our new series called God With Us, because the story of Christmas is a story of how God is with us. And we take time every year, not just to celebrate it, but to really dive in deep and to talk about it. But before we go there, I'm just really sticking with the last song that the worship team just led us in. Some of the lyrics that I wrote down, if my phone wants to listen to me. For your glory and for your name. Like that is something that is sometimes hard for us to remember that how God operates. Yes, he is doing stuff for our good and he is doing stuff for our future. But the number one priority is that God gets the glory and that he gets the praise that is deserved unto his name. And as we talk about Christmas, and as we talk about some of the struggle that the people of Israel were going through, we're going to see that God doesn't always work on our timetable. God is out, yes, for our good, but for his glory. And I want us to remember this morning that I know nothing is wasted. It's easy for us to say nothing is wasted, but it's another thing for us to say, I know that in my life, nothing is wasted. So let me pray, and then we'll dive in this morning. Jesus, I thank you for that song and for those words, God, that you are the potter that we can trust completely. God, that we can come before you and say, I know that nothing is wasted because of the plans that you have, not just for my life, but for our entire world, God. So God, as we, as we dive into Christmas, as we look to what you have for us, God, would you be in it completely, and would we just cling to every word that you have for us this morning? It's in your name we pray. Amen. Before I forget, we have a kid's time that's happening right now, so if you're watching right now and you get our weekly email, you'll see that there's a link there for a Zoom meeting, so if you have kids that they're like, oh, Pastor Mark's talking again, they can leave and join the Zoom meeting where there will be a lot more fun and excitement than what this face has to offer. So shout out to all of our kids who are meeting right now. Today is the first day of Advent, the Advent season of Christmas, and our theme today is hope. The title of my message today is Hope Unexpected, or if I flip it around the right way, Unexpected Hope. And the reality is it's hard to have hope when you're disappointed. I know for myself, 2020 has not been the year that I thought it was going to be, and sometimes we can get caught in these seasons of hopelessness because of disappointment, because things haven't been going the way that we would like them to go. It's hard for us to look forward to the future and think, you know what, God is looking out for my future. God, lo God is looking out for my good We've been in this journey of waiting for our house to be renovated so that we can move into it. And that is one thing that in our household has been a struggle for us is because with, with COVID and delays and everything, there's been a lot of disappointment. And so there's been a lot of times when hopelessness has started to rear its ugly head in our household and it lasts for a little bit and then we get locked back in and then it comes back around a month later. And it's hard sometimes to stay locked in with hope. And we know that we're not the only ones in our world that have been disappointed this year. When this all happened, like we were hoping that by summertime, COVID would be done and gone and we'd be free. We're in December, we're almost in December, and we're still where we were back then. And the reality is, is that the people of Israel that we're gonna talk about today know a lot about disappointment. There was a time period between what we know as the Old Testament and the New Testament of about 400 to 500 years of silence, centuries of God not speaking to the people. 
but there were promises that were given. Prophets throughout the ages were giving these promises to the people of Israel, and they were telling them, hey, there is a hero that is going to come, a Messiah who's going to fix everything. And Malachi was the last prophet that we have that was writing down words for the people of Israel. And then there was about 400 to 500 year gap between what Malachi wrote and where we see Jesus show up in the New Testament. But even by the time that Malachi was there, there had already been about a hundred years or two generation gap from Malachi to Isaiah and some of the other prophets who gave a lot of those messianic prophecies of the hero is coming. And even within those 100 years, the Israelites had become disillusioned. They were like, it's been a hundred years and where's God? Where's this Messiah that we have promised? When are we going to be saved and and things are going to be restored. And if they got tired of waiting after 100 years, then this period of 400 to 500 years hits them smack across the face. And in that time period, Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire comes in, takes over Israel. The Greek Empire splinters into a hot mess and then the Roman Empire comes in, sweeping up the pieces. And so the people of Israel have been waiting and they've been waiting And they've been waiting. Sometimes I feel like we in our country and the rest of the world have been waiting and been waiting and been waiting. And it's just been 11 months, people. Like, it hasn't even been 400, 500 years. (laughs) And Isaiah, in chapter 7, he wrote to Israel, and he told them in verse 4, he said, let me find it. No, I have my notes wrong. In verse 14, there we go, we got it. Isaiah says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and will give birth to a son and you will call him Emmanuel, which Emmanuel is Hebrew, which means God with us. And it's interesting because Isaiah, when he was writing this, he wasn't telling the people of Israel like, hey, Emmanuel is going to come and it's literally going to be God with us. And hundreds of years from now, this is what this is going to mean. When Isaiah wrote this, he was talking to the king and he told the king like, hey, God says that some bad stuff is going to be coming and God wants you to ask him for a sign. And Ahaz is trying to be all holier than thou. And he's like, no, I won't ask God for a sign. That would be testing God. When it was God himself who said, ask me for a sign. So it's like, give me a, ask me and I will give you a sign. No, Lord, I don't want to test you. He's being all holier than thou. And Isaiah's response is, well, you know what? God is going to give you a sign that a virgin is going to give birth to a son and his name will be Emmanuel. And then by the way, a bunch of bad stuff is going to happen for Israel when that happens. But then 400, 500 years later, as, as people are recognizing what is happening in Jesus' story, they're like, hold up. What, what Isaiah wrote for that king is also working for us right now because this story of a young girl, a virgin giving birth to a son who is literally God with us. Isaiah was calling the shots back then for the king of Israel at the time, but he was also calling the shots for what would happen literally centuries later. And the people of Israel have been tired and they've been waiting But something new is happening, something that they would never expect in 500 years. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26, if you'll join me. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin who was pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary replied, how will this be, she asked, because I am a virgin. We're going to pause there. Hope comes in the unexpected. 
For hundreds of years, Israel has been crying out to the Lord, like, when are you going to save us? When is this Messiah going to come? Rid us of the Roman Empire. Rid us of the Greeks. When are we going to be finally that kingdom and this Messiah that is going to reign forever? These promises about the Messiah said that Israel would be like number one kingdom of the earth and that all of the other kingdoms would be bringing tribute to them and they would be top dog. And right now Israel feels like bottom dog. They feel like the dog that's at the bottom of the pile and the pound where all the other dogs are sleeping on top. They're like, when is it going to be our time? And this young girl probably a young teenager, if not a tween, is, is hanging out most likely in her house, and poof, this angel appears, a man, and she's like, hold up, what's going on here? Man in my bedroom, do I sc start screaming? And he says, greetings, Mary, you are highly favored by God. And she's troubled by this because everybody else that's been told highly favored by God usually ends up getting put in the Bible because they're kind of a big deal. They end up leading armies into battle. They end up being kings and queens. They end up doing all the crazy stuff. And for her to hear, hey, you're fa highly favored by God, she's like, am I? I'm just a kid. I'm not going off to battle. I'm not going to go and save Israel. What kind of greeting is this? What do you want? And then he explains to her, hey, you're going to have a baby, and this baby's going to be the most important baby that has ever existed. And her response is, how will this be since I'm a virgin? This is an unexpected thing. Like, I'm pledged to be married, but like, are you saying this is going to come later, or, or what's happening? This is unexpected to me. How will this be? And as we talk about hope, as we talk about this feeling of, of hopelessness, sometimes we ourselves ask this question of, how can I hope? How will this be? How will this be since we're in COVID? How am I supposed to go and tell other people about God? How am I supposed to have a happy Thanksgiving or a Merry Christmas? How am I supposed to be happy when we're in this season right now, God? I don't see the hope that I am supposed to have. But the angel doesn't just give her this message and go poof. She asks this question, and he responds. In verse 35, the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be, may your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. I love Mary's response. This morning, earlier in our Bible study, we read about the story of John the Baptist. And in that story, Zechariah is visited by an angel. And his response is, how do I know that you're telling me the truth? Because I'm super old. And these two people have a question. Zechariah's question is, how can I trust you? And Mary's question is, how is this going to happen? Can I get a little bit more detail? The angel replies to Zechariah, hey, because you don't trust me, you're not going to be able to speak for nine months. And Mary just gets the actual answer of, hey, God is going to do it for you. Two people have a question. Mary's question is like, okay, yes, but can I get a little bit more detail? I love how she's just not like, nope, I'm calling the cops because there's a stranger in my house who's telling me weird stuff. Get out of here. She's like, no, like, I trust God. What do I need to do? How will this be? And the answer to her is also as encouraging to us. The Holy Spirit is going to be on you, and the Holy Spirit is going to be in you. People living at this time did not usually experience the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Before Jesus came and lived, died, rose from the dead, and then sent the Holy Spirit to us, people experienced God's presence on their lives in a on sort of way. Anytime we see in the Old Testament people talking about the Holy Spirit, the majority of times is the, the Holy Spirit came on to them, and then usually after a time, it leaves them. King Saul, David, Samson, all of these people had the Spirit of God resting upon them. But then when the Holy Spirit comes to Pentecost, for us believers, the Holy Spirit indwells us. We have his presence with us always and forever, and it does not get taken 
away. And for Mary, this encouragement is like, hey, God's going to do all the work for you. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, and this, this life is going to be knit within your womb without you having to pull a muscle, without you having to do anything. Boom, it's there. And Mary's response, I love her response, is, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. The other point I want to grab out of this passage is that no word from God will ever fail. This is important to remember because she's like, hey, how is this going to happen? He's like, Holy Spirit's going to come on you. And, and if you need a little bit more hope, if you need a little bit more explanation, God gave his word to your relative Elizabeth, who's super old, and yet she's already six months pregnant. Go and visit her. See the miracle that has taken place, and that is going to boost your hope. That is going to bolster you and be like, oh, my gosh. Like, if God can do that for her, God can do it for me. And then he follows up with, because no word from God will ever fail. Some other translations say, nothing is impossible with God. And I want us to cling to those words when we talk about hope. That even when we look at the world around us, even when we have our disappointments in our hands, we also look at the words that God has given us. We look at what God has said and say, if God gave a word and we know that his words will never fail and we know that nothing is impossible with God, then that is going to outweigh my disappointment. My son's name is Joshua and, and in his room, he has out of the first chapter of Joshua that God told Joshua, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And when I hear that the word of God will never fail, yes, that was a promise to Joshua, like, hey, you're going to go into a lot of battles, and God's always going to be with you. But Jesus gave us the same promise, that, that with the Holy Spirit with us, and because he is with us as well, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be discouraged, because God is with us literally wherever we go. And if I trust in that fact, then I can push away the discouragement. I can push away the fear. I can be strong. I can be courageous. I can hold on to the hope that we see in this story of Christmas. And so the reality is that the story of Christmas is a story of hope. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be seeing all the different weeks of Advent, of, of hope and joy and Jesus and all of these things. And today we're remembering hope. And I think it's super important for us that hope comes first, especially in the year that we've all experienced. I've seen a lot of frustration on social media of Thanksgiving being a lot different this year, and it's sort of sucked some of the hope out of us. But I would encourage us all that as, as this Christmas season comes back in, that we remember that the story of Christmas is a story of hope. And we, as servants of the Lord, are hope carriers. The question I have for all of us this morning is, what will your response be? Mary's response was, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. I want all of us to say, I am the Lord's servant. May his word in my life be fulfilled in this season, in this year, in next year, all of my life. Because servants of the Lord have hope. And I don't believe that we as Christians are allowed to walk around hopeless. Now, I'm not saying if you don't have hope right now that you're not a Christian, but I'm saying in those times of hopelessness, we need to look into ourselves and say, what is the problem? Why am I not experiencing hope right now? What do I need to call out to God and say, I need hope right now? What fear do I need to give up to the Lord and say, I need help? I want us in this Christmas season when the rest of the world is getting anxious, getting discouraged, being afraid. I want people that know Christians in their life to be like, there's something different about them that even in the midst of what we've experienced this year, they have hope. If you'll join me in praying, I'd like to invite the worship team up to the front and Pastor Dan is also going to lead us into a time of communion. Jesus, I thank you for hope, God. I thank you for the reality that the story of Christmas is a story of hope. 
God, there is nothing that we need to worry about because nothing is wasted as we sang about earlier, God. That nothing we have to worry about because everything is in your hands. So Jesus, I thank you for Mary. I thank you for Mary's response, God, because if I was in that same situation, I'm not sure I would have the same gung-ho attitude of, yes, Lord, I say yes to exactly what you have in store for me, even if that means surprise pregnancy. I don't think I would have been on board, Lord, but she was. And that's why we celebrate her, God, because she was willing to be your servant. So God, I pray that over each and every person that is watching this right now, God, that we can say, we are your servants, Lord. May your word be fulfilled through us. It's in your name we pray, amen.